Yeah, so good afternoon everyone. Again, welcome to the our fourth workshop for the Hack and Roll 2021. Today we will be having a workshop about intro to Telegram bots, which will be be broke by Ninja Fan. And all the teams are already here. You can see the other co-hosts aside from me. They are all the representatives from Ninja Fan. And yeah, without further ado, I will just like give a very very short, uh, maybe like introduction about like the speakers for today. So today we will be having Sean, Mani, and Dexter. You can take a look at the speaker profile, which we have also published in our Hack and Roll website. And yeah, uh, Sean is the co-founder of Ninja Fan and and others uh, and CTO of the Ninja Fan. And Dexter and Mani both are also like software engineer at. In Japan, and we have also Wesley here, the the represent, another representative from In Japan, which will be helping all of you to get through the workshop session. And yeah, without further ado, I will just like hand over the time to the team, uh, the speakers who are going to bring the workshop for today. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Um, so Mani, can I just get you to uh, present the slides? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining uh, this workshop. I hope uh, you know you take something out of uh, this today. Um, I mean, we will be sharing with you some of the stuff that uh, we've been building. We are very focused on uh, technology at Ninja Van. Um, lots of people look at us as a logistics company, but um, you know, I'm, I always tell everyone that 95% uh, of what we do uh, relies on the systems that we build. And uh, we will not be here uh, if not for the existence of technology. So uh, obviously I have uh, with me uh, two of my very uh, distinguished uh, engineers. We have uh, Mani and, and Dexter. Um, they are the ones who are going to give you all the meat into this. Uh, uh, Dexter is going to be your main instructor uh, for today's session. Um, I'll let him uh, introduce himself uh, later on. Uh, okay, on to the next slide. Uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit, uh, maybe one, two minutes to tell you more about Ninja Van. I hope all of you know who we are. We are the guys in red, uh, you know, delivering your parcels, uh, especially during this um, difficult period of COVID. Uh, we have, you know, powered through. We've been, uh, you know, classified as an essential business trying to uh, keep you guys safe while you were staying at home and uh, bringing you that little bit of joy during those uh, two difficult months, right? So uh, yeah, next slide. We started in Singapore uh, like about five, five-ish plus years uh, ago, um, just with a team of uh, six people, of which like four of us were all software engineers. The other two are my co-founders. Uh, one was doing, uh, uh, working on the business side of things and one was working on the operation side of things. So if you look at it, we're really a tech company, okay? Uh, next slide, we uh, show you where we are today. You know, after uh, actually after two years, we already uh, moved out into six countries. Uh, but what's really uh, phenomenal is that we have, uh, you know, hundred percent coverage, right? Uh, wherever you are in Indonesia, whether you are in uh, Papua um, or in Vietnam, in one of those, uh, you know, little uh, townships, we serve. Um, we basically serve the entire geographies of these uh, six countries. Okay. Uh, next slide. And. Yeah, we count some of the biggest players in the market in e-commerce uh, and, you know, the brand name dot coms uh, as our customers and um, for them, technology visibility into uh, all the orders, uh, you know, real time information is uh, really critical and we're supporting uh, all of that uh, and helping them grow in, in the, the same uh, markets that we're in as well. Right. And next. So a little bit of our numbers, since uh, this is a technical uh, workshop, uh, we really deal with quite a bit of load uh, and transactions. We serve uh, monthly 4 billion uh, requests. In fact, this number has probably grown. Uh, this was a number that I took like four or five months ago. Uh, we ingest a, a, you know, a crazy amount of data uh, every single day, uh, structured, unstructured data. Um, and we're, of course, uh, you know, going with the trend, uh, we build everything uh, on, on microservices. Um, and everything in our environment is uh, containerized uh, in Docker, uh, and you know we 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 rely on Kubernetes, which is um, yeah I would say is the de facto uh, for running, deploying, and keeping your applications alive. Um, and Kubernetes really has uh, allowed us to uh, you know deploy quickly, uh, scaled up extremely um, flexibly with a lot of agility. All right, and next. 
Okay, so um, I guess today, uh, you know, you don't really want to hear about Ninja Van, but um, got to do that branding. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, what we've done uh, with chat. Uh, chat's really something that we're trying to embrace a bit more, connecting with our consumers. Uh, we'll go a bit more in depth into Telegram. Uh, Dexter's going to take it away and, and yeah, teach you how to build what we're doing, or at least uh, a subset of what we're doing. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I, I would like to pass this time to Mani. He's going to show you um, a little bit of a quick demo on what we've done uh, with chat, not just with Telegram, but uh, everything out there that we try to uh, integrate with uh, uh, Viber, Messenger, even uh, in Vietnam, we have something called Zalo. We're, we're working with all these platforms. Okay, over to you, Mani. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, hi, all. <laughs> Welcome to our, our workshop. I hope you guys take away some um, interesting stuff uh, from today's workshop. Uh, before we, uh, you know, start on uh, with our discussion on um, uh, Telegram, building a Telegram bot, we wanted to just highlight of uh, how this story began of Ninja Chat. Uh, Ninja Van's culture is quite encouraging. So, uh, you know, we have this program called as a, a hack day uh, where you can build projects for fun, right? We do it to motivate engineers, to encourage people to pursue some innovative ideas. And as part of one of our hack day, uh, we wanted to uh, solve a problem, which is uh, try to save some uh, cost on SMSs. And one of the way that we uh, thought was quite innovative was why don't we use social media, right? Uh, you know, every, everyone's now on social media nowadays, you know, you have Telegram, you have uh, Messenger, WhatsApp, and all of these chat platforms. Uh, and that's how we, uh, you know, did a very small project. We tried to uh, uh, push our parcel updates on uh, uh, these social media platforms. And what we realized is the, the outreach of this social media platforms was quite uh, significantly high. We saw a lot of people trying to uh, reach out to us for parcel inquiries, trying to reach out to us to uh, reschedule their parcels, to change some delivery details in the parcels. And this led us to uh, building uh, uh, Ninja Chat, right? Uh, and it's a chat platform, a more powerful platform where we give a lot of self-serve options to the consumers. Uh, they can reach out to our customer service easily. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, when we launched, we only launched for two platforms, Messenger and uh, Telegram. But you know, as we kept seeing a lot of uh, people on different platforms, we started opening it up to Viber, Line, and even WhatsApp. Right, and uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into what features we have right now on chat, but I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief demo of how powerful uh, chat can be. Uh, so let's just go to our tele, uh, to our Facebook Messenger uh, page. One sec. Let's open that up. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, if you guys have received parcel from us, most likely you might have received uh, an SMS that leads to our Facebook or, or Telegram page. And you know, this is the, the, the bot that you most likely would have interacted with to track your parcels or uh, you know, to even reach out to uh, customer service officers. So for instance, uh, you know, uh, let's just click track orders and you can see a history of all of your parcels uh, uh, over here. And you can do some of the functions that you usually do like you know, rescheduling your parcel uh, contactless delivery, which is a very interesting uh, feature that we rolled out during COVID. So I'm sure most of you guys ordered a lot during COVID, right? Uh, and what we saw is a lot of people, uh, because of this whole COVID, contactless delivery was a lot preferred. And it was quite one of our uh, fastest rollouts. So over the night, we just rolled this out uh, for people to be able to choose contactless delivery uh, on chat. So whenever you have a parcel coming to you, uh, we push a notification to you, hey, you know, there's this parcel on the way uh, to delivery and would you like us to leave it at your doorstep, right? And usually when people select, uh, our driver will just leave it at your doorstep at a preferred location that you're going to stay on chat, right? Uh, and all of this is completely powered by a lot of tech in the background, uh, which Dexter will uh, walk you guys through uh, in uh, a little later. 
but what I want to highlight is, uh, you know, just some of these uh, features that you uh, that you can build on chat, which are quite powerful. So, for instance, how do you reach out to a customer service office? How do you build something to reach out to your customer service officers to facilitate uh, all of this chat ecosystem, right? Like, for example, you can reach out to our CS from uh, our Facebook chat and you can uh, you know select a parcel uh, about which you want to inquire about and instantly we will connect you to one of our CS agent right let's just try it out I'm not going to connect you guys to a real agent <laughs> I'll just assign this ticket to myself uh, so that I can just demo you guys okay let's do this uh... Okay, you can see that uh, I'll be assigned to this ticket shortly. Um, here you go. There you go, right? So you can see the, the, the power of chat is you can uh, connect the, the customers directly to the CS agents just with a click of a button, right? And you can see it's quite easy for the CS agents to address customer queries. So what you see on the right side is what a CS agent usually uh, sees on his day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is what he does. He uh, uh, tries to address customer queries. And you can see that you know, there's all these real-time indicators. Uh, the customer can see that the CS agent is typing. Uh, there's a two-way engagement. We can send parcel photos, pictures. Uh, you know, or the CS agent can also send the customer a picture. And once he's done, he closes the chat. Right, and uh, you see the, the power of this, right? is not just that we have built this platform purely for Messenger, right? You go to Telegram, you go to Viber, you go to Line, the whole framework is the same across all the platforms. Uh, so what you guys will learn today doesn't just apply for, uh, say, one platform, right? Uh, you guys will be learning uh, how to build a bot, but in general, it's a generic framework. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys uh, enjoy the show today. And uh, before we run through the actual demo, I would like to just briefly talk about uh, how our platform is built, the different components of our platform. So when, for example, when you type something on Facebook, right, what's the first thing that gets triggered, right? Uh, you are typing into a, a messenger client and this client uh, probably uh, is sending uh, these events to a Facebook server and Facebook server fires something called as a webhook, right? In modern world, almost all enterprise systems uh, out there are usually built uh, a lot of them are built with webhooks. Webhook is just an event that you listen to asynchronously, right? And when Facebook fires this event to, uh, to us, which is what we call as SNS, which is nothing but just Ninja Chat, it's a backend server that listens to these events, right? And uh, when our service listens to these events, it tries to uh, understand the user's intent, right? What is a user trying to do? Is he trying to track a parcel? Is he trying to contact the customer service? Does he want to leave his parcel at his doorstep? And we try to deduce this and uh, we act accordingly. So if the, if, the, if the customer wants us to leave the parcel at his doorstep, then we have to somehow uh, make sure that our driver who goes to the site needs to know that he has to leave the parcel at the doorstep and he shouldn't, uh, yeah, he shouldn't ask for an authorization code for that since you have already authorized it. Uh, for a contactless delivery, right? So, uh, and another interesting component that uh, we will briefly walk you guys through is Dialogflow. Dialogflow is a Google's managed service which uh, specializes uh, for its ability uh, to do natural language understanding, right? Uh, what does this mean? Uh, you know, as a customer, you are going to type a free text query into the chat. You're gonna say, hey, where is my parcel? Or you're gonna say, hey, I want to leave the parcel at my doorstep. Dialogflow gives us the ability for us to be able to understand the user intention based on, uh, based on uh, 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 an input query text. Not just that, uh, Dialogflow also has more powerful abilities. Like for example, it can understand the intent based on uh, an audio file, 
right? Uh, so it, it's quite powerful. Uh, we'll walk you guys through some of these use cases that Dialogflow uh, specializes in. Okay, saying that uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Dexter, um, you wanna take over? Yep, thanks Mani. Let me just share my screen. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, like what Mani said, we rely heavily on uh, webhooks. Uh, and today I'll go through, uh, firstly, what are some of the APIs that Telegram offers. So you can think of an API as uh, an interface. It, it, it stands for application programming interface. It's an interface, uh, uh, it's a way for applications to expose uh, certain common functions, uh, functionalities or operations uh, without having uh, to review the complexity, the, the underlying complexity below the API. So for example, Telegram would support an API that allows you to send a message to a user uh, without having clients be aware of uh, how they store that data or what are some of the other requests that they have to make and how, how they structure, uh, structure their code underneath. So today we'll be going uh, into some of the APIs that we'll be using to build a chatbot. So the first, uh, API, uh, set of APIs that we'll be using is uh, being able to be informed whenever uh, a user sends your bot a message. So for Telegram, right, uh, they support two ways of getting such updates up. Uh, they, they refer to updates as uh, messages or, or events that are triggered by users. So it could be like a, a user sending you a, a text message or a user sharing a contact with you. Uh, all these are referred to as updates that uh, you can then uh, be informed of uh, on your backend application. So there are two ways. The first way is polling, which is where your application repeatedly makes a HTTP request uh, to Telegram servers to check, okay, are there any new uh, messages or updates that are sent by, by users to your bot? And then uh, in, the, in this case, like Telegram would be, Telegram would be saying, okay, uh, no, there are no messages or, or they might return uh, the list of messages that have been, uh, that have accumulated since the last time you pulled uh, their server. And this is done with calling uh, the get updates uh, endpoint that they have uh, provided. The second way is what Mani mentioned, uh, which is where you register a webhook, uh, which is basically a, a callback request. Uh, and your application is telling uh, Telegram that, okay, uh, if there are any new updates, please send it to me at this URL, at this endpoint that I have configured with you guys. So a webhook is something that Telegram would be providing, and then they would be specifying like uh, within each update, uh, this is the structure of the message that we'll be posting to your endpoint that you've given us. So if you think about it, right, uh, there are two ways you can do this, but one way would lead to uh, a much lower server load because uh, with webhooks, uh, Telegram would only be calling you whenever there are messages as opposed to polling where you have to repeatedly make this, uh, these requests to Telegram servers to, to get those messages. Uh, another benefit of using webhooks is that your data is uh, delivered to your application in real time, right? Like uh, for polling, you probably have to configure a frequency, how often you want to be querying Telegram servers for, for these messages. Uh, and then you have to keep doing that. So whenever you receive a set of messages, those will be the messages that have accumulated since the last time you pulled. And it may not be uh, what your users are, are communicating to your bot in, in real time. So uh, for today's workshop in particular, we will be focusing on the second approach. Uh, I know that in the past, there were some workshops for Telegram uh, bots as well. And even the Telegram library that we are using today, uh, they, they recommend the, the method where you, know, you, you instantiate a bot and then you, you call a polling method. And, and, and in that case, your bot will uh, instance will repeatedly pull uh, their servers for messages and then uh, you will handle those uh, messages as they arrive. Uh, but like what Mani, uh, Mani said just now, uh, we are trying to help you uh, build a, a framework that is generic enough that you can extend it to uh, other, other social media platforms. So in this case, right, uh, webhooks are something that uh, most other uh, social media platforms would already offer. And it's not really Telegram specific. So uh, it, it is something that it is something that your uh, this what what you built today will be able to handle. Like say for example, if you want to ex extend your Telegram bot to to other uh, social media platforms. Yeah, the second category of APIs uh, that we'll be looking at is uh, how 
uh, to get your application to send a message back to the user. So the first one, uh, we talk about receiving these messages that are incoming, right, from your user to the bot. The second category of APIs that we'll be dealing with is how then do we uh, send that message or send that response back to, to the bot. So for such uh, API calls, uh, if you have already done your setup, you'll realize that when you create your bot, uh, you will be given an access token. So this access token allows your application uh, to impersonate the bot and be able to, to make uh, conduct, carry out, exec uh, execute operations on behalf of your bot, such as sending messages to, uh, to users. And then the second thing you will need is the chat ID, which is Telegram's way of identifying uh, users that, that are communicating with your bot. So it's unique uh, across uh, users. And when you make a HTTP request uh, using their API, you will need to specify this chat ID as well so that your messages uh, reach your targeted user, for example. So there are, there are actually quite a lot of APIs. Uh, if you refer to the, their online documentation, you, you can see like a, a, a whole list of APIs. Uh, you can send like photos, documents, uh, contacts, and even locations. Uh, but for today's workshop, we'll mostly just be focusing on sending messages to the user. And the structure right, uh, that you will need to follow for making these uh, HTTP requests is uh, this, this highlighted bit here where uh, you have Telegram's domain and then you uh, have to specify your access token. And then finally, the method name, which is uh, the ones here, send message, send photos, send documents. So uh, some cool things that we are actually doing on Ninja Chat with uh, such APIs, right? Okay, so maybe we're not, uh, for, for live chat, we will be using send photo, for example, uh, to forward these, uh, images that are coming in from live chat agents back to the user. Uh, but other cool things such as uh, send contact, right? For example, uh, we have actually, if you uh, later on, if you try to use our bot and, and you want to subscribe to our Telegram bot, what, what is gonna happen is we will first require you to subscribe to our, to our chat bot. And in that case, right, uh, our flow actually has this portion where we provide you with a button for you to send a contact to us. So in, instead of having you to uh, instead of having you uh, input your phone number manually to pass us uh, the number for registration, uh, we are able to make use of of the like Telegram's way of handling contacts to immediately get your user information and then uh, carry on with the subscription flow. So the screenshot here is just an example of uh, how uh, this API will be used later when we build our bot. So. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be basically using the bot to send messages or responses back to the user. Uh, but this is good, right? Uh, but in case you want to extend that experience, uh, you want to make it uh, easier for your user to interact with your bot, what you can also do is to provide options. So just now when Mani was going through the demo for Ninja Chat, you'll see that uh, with each response from the bot, we actually provide a series of predefined options that the user can make. Uh, and then it would then trigger another response from the bot after the user has made that selection. So options are a way to simplify uh, these interactions and also structure structure your conversations according to how uh, you have really handled it in the back end. So for example, uh, this is the greeting message, right? For our main uh, bot that we'll be building later. For, uh, for example, assuming that we have already uh, added some logic to handle like uh, showing customers what's on, on this hypothetical menu bot, uh, ordering bot, uh, you, you want to show customers what are their orders, you can include options here that the customer can then select. And then it would uh, basically move the conversation along because uh, it, will, it will be part of the conversation history. So uh, there are two types of keyboards, uh, option types that Telegram mainly supports. And that is reply keyboard, the first one. And, and later I'll be talking about inline keyboards as well. So we'll be mainly dealing with uh, reply keyboards uh, today where we, provide something in the uh, send message API. Uh, it's a reply markup view. We specify an object where we make the a API request. And then what the user expects to see on their end is a set of options here that uh, replaces uh, the keyboard that they traditionally have on the uh, chat interface. So they are able to toggle back to the keyboard by pressing this, this key here. But uh, assuming they select something, this message would then be uh, replaced in the, I mean, added to the conversation history. And then the bot will continue to process the incoming request that is received either via, you know, web or polling, uh, normally given the text that is supplied in the option here. 
So the second uh, category of options that Tyram provides is uh, inline keyboards, which is the ones that you, you saw on our Ninja chat board just now. They are pers uh, the primary difference between inline keyboards and reply keyboards is that these options are persistent. So they would be uh, included in the main uh, conversation history that you have with the bot. And then when you tap on them, uh, you don't get the same kind of like uh, feedback that you get when you tap a reply keyboard, which is where the, the input gets inserted into the conversation history. What you instead see is uh, you can do something like open a URL when it's tapped or, or issue a callback uh, to, the, to your backend application. And then uh, your backend application will be responsible for you know, uh, sending a response and, and stuff like that. So uh, this is the second category, but we will not be using this because there's additional complexity, especially if you uh, use the callback approach uh, where your application is notified of any clicks where you have, uh, Telegram requires you to answer the callback. So you'll need to make an additional like uh, HTTP request to, to answer this callback so that, uh, you know, when you tap this, there'll be a loading indicator here and, and Telegram requires you to, to, to make that request so that you can inform the user that, okay, we've processed this request and, and here's our response. So we, we won't be using this today, but if you guys are interested in checking uh, out this feature, you can always refer to the link if the slides are provided later. And yes, uh, the last thing that we will talk about is commands. Uh, so if you are a Telegram user, it's, it's highly likely that you've encountered commands. Uh, commands are, it's actually unique to Telegram. I, I don't think the other platforms that uh, Ninja Chat supports has something like commands yet. Uh, it's a way where you are able to directly communicate uh, your intent uh, specifically without having to go through like, okay, passing the free text to see or if it contains certain keywords. Uh, Cause Telegram, when they when your application receives that update on uh, uh, this update from, from your user, right? Uh, what it's going to be contained is already formatted. Like it's, it's structured already. So it, it might pass you a series of uh, commands and then says, uh, and then say like, okay, we received these three commands, start menu and please, uh, please handle them accordingly. So uh, yeah, on Telegram to, to just, to make a command, you just need to prefix it with a uh, forward slash. And then even when your bot uh, replies, right? Uh, for example, if I, in my response, I have a, a slash menu command in, in the response, it will also be highlighted in the conversation history so that your user can easily tap on this menu command and then uh, go on with, uh, and then it will be uh, issued to the bot and your bot would, and your application will receive this update. Right, and uh, since the focus of this workshop today uh, is uh, building a Telegram bot, we won't really be focusing too much on dialogue flow, but we thought that, uh, you know, it'd be cool to, to integrate uh, this NLP service so that you can get a more interactive and engaging like uh, experience with your bot. And, and you can also build cooler stuff with, with uh, Dialogflow. So uh, with Dialogflow, right, there are some concepts that maybe we, we need to run through first, but since uh, most of this is already set up for you when you uh, do your setup, uh, you won't really have to touch with this unless you are interested, you can uh, of course uh, create your account and agent and then uh, try this out yourself. So. Uh, a couple of concepts to familiarize yourself with is, uh, firstly, if you say you have a flow, right, and, and you want to create an order, for example, or you want to, uh, yeah, create an order, how you would uh, map out that flow is maybe the first the user will have to say, uh, I want to create an order, and then your bot will respond, okay, what do you want in your order? And then the user will then repeatedly reply, okay, I want this, I want, I want a burger, I want, I want a salad, and, and stuff like that. So in that case, right, uh, how Dialogflow is able to map out this flow is it uses something referred to as intents, where an intent is basically uh, a way of capturing an intention uh, in that flow. So when the user says something right, like, uh, I want to order something, or can I see your menu? Or can I see your menu? The intention for that phrase, that utterance is check menu. So in that case, what, what it, you would create an intent that uh, corresponds to that and it will be like ninja cafe main check menu and then uh, another thing that dialogue flow has is input and output context which are uh, which determine at which point in your flow your user is in right now so at the start of the flow you might have a uh, context that's like order main and then as you progress along the flow you want to make sure that you deactivate certain contexts 
to inform so that Dialogflow is able to pinpoint exactly where your user is in that flow. So input context allow you to control whether certain intents that you've set up will be matched given a user's input. So a user could say something like, yes, right? And maybe this yes utterance could match a number of things. It could be, yes, I want to order something or yes, I want to return back to the main menu. So to distinguish this, right, uh, to control which intents will be matched, you would need to use uh, context. And then output context is just uh, when this intent is matched, what are the new output contexts that will be set for the current conversation? Uh, and three more other things. Uh, action, which is whenever you match an intent, what is the logic that you want to execute? So when you match the check menu intent or you match this particular select item intent, uh, you would want to configure a certain string. It's anything you, you want it to be. So it could be like, for in this case, update order. And then when your uh, backend application receives that result, right, it's going to carry out certain logic. Like maybe it would add certain orders to your current, uh, add certain items to your current order, and then uh, yeah, return a, uh, a response back to the user. And then the cool part that we've also included in our agent uh, today is being able to capture certain parameters. So uh, parameters here are, if you've done programming before, you would have like in Python, there'll be types, right? Like you have an integer type or a Boolean type. So parameters are something like types that you can define. And then when uh, you train uh, your agent using training phrases, you can actually define certain phrases, uh, define certain parts of the phrase as a parameter. So we could have, in this case, you notice these highlighted parts, right? Uh, since we've defined a parameter food item, for example, we can highlight certain phrases, uh, certain parts of the phrase to correspond to food item. And then uh, when you call Dialogflow and Dialogflow gives you a match, you can actually inspect the result and see, okay, it captured uh, five servings of mac and cheese as a food item. And then you are able to handle it accordingly and, and you know, add like that, that food item to your current order, for example. Yeah, and then the last thing is just uh, text response. When this match happens, what are the responses that uh, are configured? And then you can just pass this on, on to, the, to the user when you call Telegram. Uh, so yeah, uh, before we go through the workshop, I guess uh, this, this state diagram is, is here to, allow, uh, to show you roughly how the agent is set up. Uh, it's not uh, super critical to know how it works since we, this isn't the focus of the workshop. But uh, we just wanted to show you like, okay, uh, these are the intents that we have set up. Each rectangle here you see uh, corresponds to an intent. And then the upper snake case string below uh, refers to the action, like what's supposed to happen after the user has uh, matched this particular intent. So at the start, right, it will say something like hello. And then uh, we have this intent that listens uh, that will match on the hello. And then the action it will take is to display a main greeting. And then from this point onwards, there could be four uh, uh, there could be four intents that could be matched after a user has has matched this intent, uh, depending on what he says. So if he wants to order something, we'll advance him to this intent and, and accordingly. And then these are all the actions that we'll be take, uh, taking. So this diagram will be providing it to you later in case uh, you want to refer to it. But yeah, uh, so I will now uh, carry on with the main part of the today's uh, presentation, which is the, the Telegram bot workshop. Uh, before I do that, I will just talk about what we are trying, uh, what we will try to accomplish today in this, uh, I guess, two hour session. Uh, we've split up into a couple of parts. The first one is the prerequisite, right? The setup, uh, making sure that you have cloned our repository and, and download the necessary, like, uh, install the necessary stuff, uh, dependencies, so that you're able to start the application. And then uh, we will do five things. The first two are the critical ones. So we want to at least make sure that your bot is able to uh, respond to an incoming webhook from the user. So if you look at this flow here, right, like uh, the user will send a message. But what happens when the update reaches Telegram server is that uh, they will call our webhook. Right, and then your application will receive the webhook. It will try to make sense of what's inside the web, the, the request. So it will try to pass the request body for useful information. And then uh, optionally, uh, if we have time, we will be doing the, sec the second part, which is we, where we try to rely, where we rely on Dialogflow to make sense of what the user has said. And then uh, like given this flowchart that we have uh, earlier, 
Telegram will, I mean, not Telegram, Dialogflow will try to make sense of what the user has said and then try to uh, return results. And then your backend application will take appropriate actions and then send a response back to the user. So part three and four, if you notice uh, when you clone our repository, right? Uh, most of the code is really provided there for Dialogflow. So we won't be focusing too much on this. Uh, the more important part is uh, being able to respond to uh, user messages for your bot. And then finally, uh, since this is like a Telegram bot, we, we thought maybe it, it would also be nice to be able to respond to certain commands that the, that the user sends your bot. So like slash start or, or slash menu, for instance. Right. So at, at this point in time, right, uh, may I know if everyone has completed the setup or maybe we can give five minutes for everyone to just check that they have everything required. I can post the link in the chat for the readme. And then uh, if anyone needs more time, just let me know. If not, I, I guess I will start in a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, so what you need to make sure, right, is that you have installed, like, uh, this, you need an IDE, PyCharm. we recommend PyCharm uh, to, to edit your code. Uh, you'll need Python 3 and pip. Pip is to uh, download your dependencies. You will need ng-rock to allow your application locally to, to access the webhook request. And then you will need Postman to configure a webhook request. Yeah, so uh, just follow these instructions uh, and then we will, yeah, if you have any problems, right, uh, just feel free to ask in the chat or you can even go to one of the breakout rooms that we've set up uh, and then we will help to troubleshoot whatever issue you're facing. But yeah, uh, I, I will start with the first part, uh, which is to connect Telegram to your, okay, maybe I'll start with the basic backend application first uh, in a few minutes. But if you have any questions in the meantime, just feel free to raise it. Okay, yeah, since I uh I don't see oh wait. Python create run configuration. Okay. Uh so assuming you have your uh application set up, actually it's not really important to create the run configuration. Uh but you will need to specify uh, which file to start when you run your application. So there are two ways, right? The first way is to within your project uh, structure. If you don't see it, you can click on view and then two windows and then project, and then this part will pop up. And then you want to make sure that you run main.py. So the first way that, okay, maybe the more straightforward way is to just right click the file, and then you can either run or debug. And then this would start your application. The second way is to set a configuration so that you don't have to do this and you can just click a button. So you'll need to edit configurations and then add a new run configuration. But okay, we don't recommend this. Maybe you can just, uh, since the project is rather small, you can just right click the main pie and then just click debug. Uh, to LGO, right, how do we copy the service account file? So, okay, uh, that is not really required anymore. Uh, maybe you can just ignore these instructions because we have provided the service account found uh, in the rep repository already. So you'll see it here. 
Ninja Van Dialogue Flow Dev MY. So uh, there's no setup required for Dialogue Flow. You just have to yeah carry on with the rest. Uh, ST find the exec executable for ng rock. So assuming that you have installed this right, let me load it up. Okay, once you've installed it, I think it's probably a zip file. Uh, there is an executable that you can run. So I think this is mine. This is the executable. You, you just have to uh, double click and, and you can run it. I'm assuming you're on yeah, Windows. And then once you have set it up, uh, uh, but we'll cover this later. So just make sure that you have the setup done. Yeah. Can you go through? Yeah. Okay, I'll go through the setup. No. Uh, can I just check, right, the, for the person that asked that, have you already installed everything? So like PyCharm, for example. Okay. Okay, then I will skip all that. Uh, let me just look at what's in the setup. Okay, have you already carried out these instructions like to configure your virtual environment? Okay, no problem. Uh, then I, I let me just go through it. So uh, I'm assuming you have Python 3 installed, like all these are done. Uh, let me just make this bigger. Yeah, so uh, if you're on with, uh, OS, right, uh, Mac OS, you will need to click on this menu. But if you are not, then you I think on Windows, it is in settings. And then you will need to make sure that there's a inter uh, Python interpreter. So depending on what you are in, uh, yeah, try to get to your preferences or settings, and then you will need to make sure that there's something set to you. If there is none, right? If it shows like no interpreter, then just click on show all and then select uh, your Python 3 interpreter. And then apply and then click OK. Uh, linking is the setup every time you open PyCharm, linking the bot to your web code. Yes. Uh, because we are using ng-rock, which is, uh, we're using the free version of ng-rock. So what will happen is they will provide you with a subdomain for you to uh, access your local host on the internet. But then this, sub, uh, this subdomain is only available for, I think, eight hours from the time that you start it up. So the next time you uh, want to run your application, you would, you would need to run this executable again because it will expire and then you will be given a new uh, forwarded address. So uh, while everyone's maybe still going through the setup and stuff, uh, I'll run through what in uh, the code that's already provided in the main repository. So you will you need to focus on two files, right? Uh, controller and main. Main is the one that we will be running whenever we start the application. Uh, yeah, this is the code uh, that we will, will be running when we start the application. So. At the start, you can see that we are creating an instance of, of a Flask application. So we are using Flask, which is a web application framework for us to, to uh, uh, receive requests and then, and then respond to those requests. So this line will create an instance of the Flask, Flask application. And then we are also re, uh, using a cache. So a cache is like a uh, fast memory for your application. Uh, for you to store certain values that then uh, you can retrieve when other requests come in. So we included a cache because uh, for dialog flows or for a bot specifically, uh, you need to maintain certain values across different uh, messages that you send to the bot. So we will also be creating an instance of, of a Flux cache using this line. And then we are, config we are passing it like a, a config object here, which basically states that uh, for this cache, we want it to be uh, implemented using a 
dictionary in Python, like a very uh, basic local dictionary in Python. And then uh, the timeout, which is uh, for cache, like when you put something in the cache, you can specify a timeout uh, in seconds where the objects will expire from the cache. So after maybe uh, 20 minutes, right? Uh, whatever you put in the cache will be removed. So this, this is what uh, these two lines are doing. And then- um, Hi, Dexter. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yes. do you mind zooming in a little bit? I think the font is it, okay. a bit too small. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Uh, is this better, Steven? Yep, looks oh. good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then since like uh, our routes right are contained in another file which is controller, we will want to be importing uh, those routes. So it, in this file, right, you can see we have specified a single route uh, on the root uh, endpoint, and then a second route for webhook, which is where we will receive the the incoming updates from Telegram later on. And then at the end, uh, we will run the application by calling the run method uh, if it's the main file. So to test right that your application is running, like what I mentioned, instead of creating the run configuration, uh, what you can simply do is to just right click and click on run. And then in another page, right, like maybe uh, your browser or something, if you see that uh, you see this message, right, uh, okay, it's serving this, this application uh, from this file and it's running on this uh, host at, at this port, you can either click on this or you can just load it up. So it's equivalent to your local host. So you can do something like this and you can see that it returns because we didn't specify a route after the, the endpoint, right? So it will be executing this function. For Flask, they are using uh, something in Python called decorators where you uh, specify like this at app.route and it would basically transform whatever function that follows, right, uh, into another function. So I think app.route uh, allows you to add a rule, a URL rule to uh, this function uh, so that uh, when you try to access uh, this endpoint when your application has started, it would execute this function. And then you can see on the right that uh, it returns hello world. If you don't see the file, right, uh, for the JSON uh, dialog flow service account key, uh, we recommend that you pull again from the repository. So, because maybe you you uh, pulled the repository before it was, uh, yeah, before it was added. Oh, wait, okay, never mind. Sean is helping. Yeah, uh, sorry, this is a different issue. Yeah, you need to specify the absolute path for the file in constants. So maybe I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, everyone can just try to make sure that uh, the application is running and that it's serving uh, at least the root route. And you are able to get the hello world after you start your application. You can see that whenever I request, uh, refresh the page also, right? Like uh, your application will log that there's a new uh, incoming request. So I'm gonna refresh it and then you can see at this time, it, it received uh, a get request. Can ignore the get part for now at this, uh, the root route, and then it returned a 200. 200 is equivalent to uh, an okay response. Like uh, this response was successful. Yeah, so what Sean was mentioning, right? Uh, like in constants.py, instead of this relative path, which, re uh, which refers to the root path, you will want to specify exactly where your uh, project is located. if I have it. Yeah, so maybe on Windows, it will look something like this. This is the full path to the file. And then you can try running it again. Uh, NGRO, you don't have to run it now. You just have to make sure it's installed. So so as I go, uh, as I move on to the first part, then we will we will need to use ng rock. 
yeah, but maybe I'll give it like two or three minutes for everyone to, to get this set up and answer any questions. And then we'll move on to the first part. Okay, uh, at any point in time, right, if anyone is lost, I have included uh, this little text here to tell you exactly which part of the uh, workshop we are in. And then there's also a Word document that you can access. So in case you want to like move forward, like if you are faster, right, and you want to see what's ahead, or if you are lost and then you want to catch up, right, uh, the stuff that I'll be going through here for the five different parts, right, are all available at this link. So you can, yeah, feel free to load it up. Or if you just want to skip ahead, right? There are also certain branches that you can access that, that already has all the completed code for the different parts. Yeah, so all you have to do, right, is to access the branch. Make sure you're on the right branch for the right part and then clone the, or, or pull from the branch. Feel free to join uh, one of the breakout rooms if you have an issue, and then someone can uh, money or Sean will be helping. Yeah, James. Uh, James, I can help you with that. Uh, Stephen, you you can add me and James to the breakout room. Okay. Uh, in that yes, case, yes, I yes. will go on with the next part. So, assuming you have your application already uh, running locally at five about five thousand, right? Uh, the next thing we want to do is to receive the web book. So as I mentioned just now, right, two, two ways of getting uh, updates from your users. The first way is to, to repeatedly ask Telegram if there are any new messages. Uh, the second way is to configure a webhook. So this is where the ng-rock application that uh, you installed just now comes in. Because when you run this application, right, it, it uh, exposes your application only locally at port 5000. So there's no way that someone on another client or, or over the internet can access this uh, URL. So this is where ng-rock comes in, where it creates a, it assigns you a subdomain uh, on the internet which proxies that request uh, to your local host, right? So uh, I think just now someone asked, yeah, 5000 is the default port. Uh, it should be the default port. You can see it when the application starts. So just now someone asked about uh, whether we need to run ng-rock. Okay, now, now is the time where we need to run ng-rock. So uh, yeah, try to find the executable. Uh, where you've installed ng-rock and then start it up. And you can see here, uh, they have provided you with this subdomain. So just test it out, right? Like to make sure that it's working. Maybe you can go, uh, you can even use it on another machine if you want, like on your phone or something. And you can make, uh, just make sure that you receive the, uh, oh wait, I'm not starting my application. 
Yeah. So when you try to access this uh, forwarded URL, you should also be able to see the hello world response. And then you can see uh, here that there's the request that came in. And then on your ng rock, you should be able to see the, the request as well. So if I refresh, you can see there's a new request here, got proxy to your local, and then your application also receives uh, the request. Uh, JY, yes, uh, ng rock HTTP 5000. So you expose your five, port 5000. Uh, for the second one, I think you might be using the wrong port. It's, it shouldn't be 80. Okay, so once you've set this up, so you already have a subdomain that points to your local host, right? Uh, let's move on. Uh, we will need to pass this address that uh, NGROG has given you to Telegram so that uh, whenever your user sends a message to your bot, Telegram will uh, make a request to this address on the internet and then your local application would then be receiving that forwarded request and then you can like process it as per usual. So uh, to do that, right, uh, we will need to can I just check if everyone has installed Postman? Because we will need to configure that. Like we provided a collection for you guys, uh, Ninja Cafe Workshop, which allows you to make these requests uh, manually without having to like, you know, go to your browser and then enter an address. Because what that will do, right? You'll, you can only make get requests and for configuring the webhook, you will need to make a post request, uh, a different type of request. So uh, let me see if I can share the address for the Postman collection again, in case uh, people haven't installed this yet. Okay, so I've pasted a link to the Postman collection. Alternatively, it's also available here at the guide. You should be able to see it uh, at the start here. Like, I think this links to the, UR, uh, to the file. So what you'll need to do is access the link, uh, download the file, like whatever as uh, .json, right? And then uh, in Postman, you will need to import it. So, uh, oh wait, you don't even need to download the file, sorry. You can import it as a link, so you just have to paste it here and then it will import the collection. And then once you've done that, what you should see is Ninja your Ninja Cafe Workshop uh, collection on the right with two requests. One, uh, one of this, the get set Telegram webhook is uh, for you to make a request to Telegram to tell them that you want to start receiving a uh, webhook uh, at this address for your for your bot. And then the second one is to test out the endpoint. So just now we could easily test the hello world endpoint by pasting the address of your Enrock subdomain into the browser. But because we have to make a post, we can't really uh, do that with the browser. We need to use something like a Postman or curl. So uh, these are the two requests that are provided. And then uh, as setup, right? you'll need to configure this. So each time you're, you're given a new Enrock subdomain, you will need to set certain variables in the collection. Of course, it will be used as part of the request. You can see here, right? The uh, request for setting your Telegram web token, it requires two variables. The first one is your bot token, which is the access token you got when you created your own Telegram bot. And then the second one is the local domain or the uh, Enrock subdomain. So the actual request will look something like this, where it injects your token as well as your, your uh, ng-rock subdomain. So to configure these uh, variables, you just have to go to your collection. Oh, how to import the JSON. Uh, it's here in import. And then you paste this link here and click continue. And then you should, this thing should pop up. Oh yeah, it's at the top, top there. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, as I was mentioning, we need to configure certain variables so that it can be used in the actual request. So uh, you will need to edit collection. 
there's these three uh, dots here. Click on edit. And then you can see that you're trying to edit the collection. And then you go to the variables tab. So uh, yeah, I, I've provided my token here, but you will need to replace this with your own token. Uh, this is a one-time setup for the token because uh, your access token never ever changes. So you can always, uh, yeah, set this token for your collection. And then the only thing that you have to change next time is, let's say you're running this uh, after your uh, ngrock uh, subdomain has expired and you rerun ngrock, you'll be provided with a new uh, subdomain, right? You will need to provide this, uh, update this value. You don't have to change initial, you can just, uh, yeah, paste the new subdomain. So I think I already did that. Just make sure that this value is updated and then click update. Yes, local domain is the ngrock URL. Uh, yeah, you can see here. And then to verify, right, you can click on code and just see that your, your variables are injected correctly. If you did not configure them, what you will likely see is it wouldn't be this, like, it will just be the, the curly braces with the variable name inside. So since you configure them, it will actually inject them into this, this code. Yeah, and then once uh, this is done, right, uh, you just have to click send and you will see a response like uh, the webhook was set. So this is the response uh, that Telegram returned uh, your request when you issued this, uh, when you executed this request. Uh, it, it tells you that, okay, your webhook was successfully set at this value. Uh, you can ignore the initial and current value. Initial is just when you first import the collection, what is the value that it gives. Then uh, as you change it, you can just make, just make sure that the current value is your ngrock uh, subdomain URL. You can ignore the initial. Yeah, so uh, when this is set, then uh, we can move on. But uh, let's also test, assuming you have your application running, let's also try out the other uh, request, which is to test your webhook endpoint. So when you send a message to the bot, what's gonna happen is uh, it's going to be sent to your ngrock subdomain with an additional route. So we have two routes here, right? The first one is the original root route, where, which we accessed just now. Uh, with local host and with the uh, ngrock subdomain. And then you return a uh, hello world for the root route. Like you notice we, if I bring this, uh, yeah, there's nothing after. So similar to this, like there's nothing after the, the subdomain. So it will just uh, execute this function. But then we have created an additional webhook uh, function so what to, to access this web uh, URL, you need to append this slash webhook and then you will execute this function. But because uh, you specify that it, it needs to be a post request, then you cannot uh, just merely enter into the browser and click enter because this issues a, a get request. That's why uh, you will need your postman collection to issue the request. So if I click on send, right? Correctly. Oh, I think it's cause I didn't return anything. Okay. Uh, maybe before we test out the collection, let's update some of the code here. Cause when we issue the request, there's nothing here. Uh, let me answer some questions. How do we verify? Uh, what do you mean by the correct credentials? Do you mean for Telegram or? Oh, okay. Uh, so for ngrock, right? To test out that you have uh, successfully proxied your uh, the ngrock domain to your local application, you can just uh, paste it into a browser and click enter. And then assuming your application is running, right, you should get the hello world response. For your Telegram token, uh, it should be issued to you when you created the bot. So uh, after you set the webhook, uh, 
and you make a message to the bot. So later we will make sure that uh, your Telegram token is, is correctly configured. Hi, do we know how to deal with module not found? Okay, so this is probably because you haven't installed uh, the dependencies yet. So uh, on your terminal, right? If you have PyCharm started, you'll need to install the dependencies that are contained in this file. So these are uh, the, the libraries that you'll need for this uh, application. You just need to make sure that you execute this command, which would then uh, install the required dependencies for you. So it's likely that you uh, maybe missed this step. Okay, I think uh, Sean and uh, Mani are checking on the NUS restriction for NGROP. But yeah, for now, maybe I'll just pause. Uh, so we will stop at this uh, setting of the webhook to answer any questions that uh, you have with the setup. For the web hook, right? Okay, if you are trying to set it, because uh, NGROP provides you with two uh, forwarded subdomains. The first one is HTTP uh, colon slash slash something, and the second one is HTTPS. Make sure that you copy the second one. Okay, and then uh, when you configure your variables, right? Uh, actually, they are the same. You just need to add the S. So make sure that this is uh, the HTTPS URL. Okay, uh, maybe I'll make one small change to this to just round out, uh, uh, to carry on with the first part. Uh, Cause for the first part, we just want to make sure that, you know, the web hook is working. So for this, let's uh, stop the application. There's a, there's a stop button here. And then let's update the web hook so that uh, it returns a message uh, when it is called. So it can return anything. You can say, yeah, what your message? Good day. So, yeah, so, uh, because you couldn't return uh, none just now. That's why the request wasn't working. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, when someone makes a post request to this web you you return uh, this message in the response. So once you have updated this, it doesn't have to be this message, it could be anything. Just run the application again. And then go to Postman, right? So just now we receive an error. This time, if we run it, you should see the post request successfully come in. Also just verify on ng-rock that you got the post web put request to your subdomain, which was then proxied here. And then it returned a 200 with this message, whatever message that you've set up just now. So this, uh, at least if you get this to work, you can verify that uh, Telegram will be able to send uh, the updates to your local application. Can I just ask if anyone uh, still needs more time for the setup for this part one? 
has everyone managed to configure their, their web hooks? Uh, you need to make sure that you get this response. Yeah, I think someone say he's getting an, a course error in the chat. Okay, I think this should be because maybe you provided the wrong uh, subdomain. I think you maybe provided the, let me test it out. It's not. Okay. Uh, maybe money or Sean, you want to help with that? Yeah, sure. I can. I can help with that, uh, Stephen. Okay, can to you answer help? Nicholas' uh, response, right? Can you make sure that you are returning something in your webhook, and then just restart your application? Make sure that you are returning a message. Because if if your uh root route right return hello world, then if you return a message, it should also route you here. When you make the post request. I think previously it was like... Uh, sorry, Mani, can you join the breakout room by yourself? Because it seems that you leave it before. <laughs> yeah, I think previously it was here maybe. So you need to make sure that you return a, a string. Yeah, and uh, yep, uh, money. Ivan is already in the travel shooting room one. Okay, maybe uh, I'll just finish the, uh, the last portion for part one and then we can continue with uh, some more troubleshooting. Uh, so if you are able to make the post request from uh, using your Postman collection, right? And get the, the message that you set up for your route, like whatever message you set up for the webhook endpoint. Then uh, let's start to involve Telegram. Uh, so we can start messaging Telegram and then make sure that your application receives the webhook. So I'm assuming that you have already uh, set up your webhook with your ngrock subdomain. So now what we want to do is to uh, make sure that we receive the request now and then return, uh, maybe print something that was in the request. So for that, let us, uh, can use this code here. You will probably need to import this library. So what this uh what this does right is it inspects the request for uh the request body as a JSON string. So JSON is a a, a notation, a way of structuring uh the request body using curly braces. So everything is structured as an object here, uh, and you have a key and then a value. So when you call this method, it will provide uh, your request body as, as a JSON string, if I'm not wrong. So what we are basically doing is trying to access the request body uh, as a JSON string, and then print on the console here, like print will just print something here on the, uh, on the console, uh, the message from user, and then the request body. 
So once you've set this up, right, uh, and make sure to return, like, okay, you can return your previous message uh, if you want. Uh, but just make sure you return something so that it returns the uh, the okay. And then once you have this, restart your application. And then uh, with your Telegram bot, right, just say whatever you want. Hello. And then if you configure the webhook correctly, you should see uh, that the request came in. So I can show ngrock as well. You should see an additional uh, post request to your ngrock subdomain. And then uh, on your console, you can see what we printed. So it tried to assess the JSON string uh, body and print it to the console. So this was what Telegram sent to you when a user messaged your bot. So it'll give you some information. Like, uh, maybe you don't need to know all of them. Like it'll give you the name of the person that, that sent you the message. It will also give you the date. Uh, this is a timestamp value. Uh, it counts the number of seconds. So uh, you can ignore this. Uh, and then there's other values about like who it was sent from and, and the language and, and a specific ID for this message. And then of course, since it was a text message, it will tell you what was sent by the user as well. So I, I type hello to the bot. So you can see here that it returned the, uh, I mean, it, it gave you a request body with the text view as hello. So this is JSON. Uh, if we format it correctly, you can see that everything is nested. Just copy this somewhere. Yeah, so everything is structured nicely in JSON. You will have a key, and then your value can be uh, any object. So it can be an object itself with its own key values. And then this is the message uh, object containing details about what the user has sent to you. And then within the message object, you can get like, you have a text view and, and stuff containing information about what the user typed. So going back, Let's say I send another message. This time, maybe I said, say that I am Dexter. And then on your application, you will receive the new web, uh, webhook request as well with the new message, hey, there, I am Dexter. Uh, we can also send emojis. I, I don't actually know what it will look like when you do. Maybe it'll be a Unicode. Yeah, so you can see the emoji comes in under the text view. You can send other things. Um, you just send image. Yeah, and then you can see that uh, when you send text view, right? When you send a text message, uh, there was this text view here. Uh, containing the message that was sent to your bot. Uh, but if you send a photo, there isn't really a text view. Instead, what Telegram passed you was information about the, the photo file, the image file that, that the user sent you. So it, it's maybe a bit hard to read here, but it's contained within the photo uh, object. I think they give you three versions of the file. So you can see, if you are familiar with arrays, you can see that I passed you an array of three objects. And I think they are of different dimensions. You can see like a height for this object is 240 by 320. And height and width for this object is uh, 600 by 800. So it gives you different file sizes for this file, as well as a file ID that identifies this image on their server. Okay, uh, Swenny, if you are getting 500, can I confirm that you are returning something in the in your dev webhook function? Make sure that you are not like returning nothing here. Uh, make sure this exists and then that you are returning something. Like if it's blank after return, right? Then it it might throw that error. So you can just return like an empty string. Okay, maybe you can uh provide a maybe can you can you dump your code in in the chat?
uh, have you, and what is the, what is your, sorry, what is your NG Rocks up to me? Like, uh, what URL are you posting to? Like, okay, in Postman, right? Maybe you can click on, go to the request and then click on code. And just paste this for me. Oh, just paste it in the chat. Like, uh, yeah, this chat that you're, you're talking in. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, your root uh, URL looks okay. Can I check, right, when you change the text, did you restart your application or, or did you just try to make the post request immediately? Like maybe you need to uh, stop and then run your application again. Yes, so uh, on PyCharm, right, if you're using PyCharm, there is a stop here. Just stop your application and then restart it. Because I, uh, when you change code, you need to make sure that you restart the application. Yeah, and then uh, try this and make sure that uh, it's it's serving your post request. Oh, nice, okay, thanks. Uh, can I just check, did anyone manage to get this working? Did anyone manage to get this working, like talk to, uh, your chatbot and then see that the request is locked. Like something like this. Okay, uh, see a couple of people. Uh, good, in that case, maybe I'll give it two to three minutes and then we'll move on to part two. So if you are falling behind, right, or if you can't get it to work, uh, I recommend that you go into one of the troubleshooting rooms. Uh, Sean and Mani will be helping you. Uh, if not, you can also download the, uh, just pull the code uh, from this part or the part two if we happen to be, if we happen to have moved on to part two. Yeah, but I'll give it like two or three minutes and then we will do the second part.
uh, when you add that, right, are you also, do you remove the return statement? Okay. Uh, can you also make sure that you, okay, uh, make sure that you restart your application. Or if that doesn't work right, then show me what you have for your webhook function. Yeah, I, I don't see your name, but uh, I, I think I'll move on to the second part. If you need help with this, I think Mani and Sean, they should be in breakout room one. Yeah, you can check with them and, and they'll help you. So uh, for the first part, what we've basically done is to uh, print out whatever web put requests that were coming from Telegram whenever like you talk to the bot. So we want to do one step further, right? Like we want to, to make, uh, make sense of whatever is in the request body. Like previously we were just assigning it at, at, to a string variable and then printing a string. Uh, right now we want to do something better, which is to identify uh, what is the name of the user? Uh, what's the user's ID, the chat ID that I mentioned just now? And then what is the user trying to say? Like what, what was a uh, message by the user here? So we need to extract these pieces, uh, three pieces of information. And then maybe we can just uh, uh, send that message back, send a message back to the user. Because right now it's not really responding to the web request. It's just returning this uh, to Telegram, which, and, and Telegram won't do anything. It will, it will just see the, the okay response and then it will just leave it as that. Yeah, so it's just accepting the, the response from your, uh, from your application. So uh, to do that, right, we will be using a library. Hopefully you should have already installed it, uh, your dependencies. Uh, this is the library that we'll be using. Uh, a library, the API client library that we'll be using is also another way of extracting away, like having to make that, that HTTP request. Because uh, normally, right, if you want to send a message to your user, you will need to call one of, and you will need to call one of the endpoints like, that Telegram provides, uh, the send message endpoint that I was providing just, uh, that I was talking about just now, you'll need to make a post request uh, to Telegram's endpoint and then Telegram will receive that request body and then send, it, send the message to the user. But uh, we've because we've installed this API client library, what we can easily do, right, is to do something like this, where we import uh, something known as, uh, import the Telebot uh, file in the API client library, and then construct an instance of uh, a class that they have defined, in this case, uh, Telebot. So once you've done that, uh, and, and of course you have to supply your API token, once you've done that, uh, you can just use a method like send message, for example, and then uh, you pass in like two values that, that they require for this function, which is the user ID or the chat ID to know who to send the message to and then the message that you're trying to send. So that, that's all you need. Like you don't have to like, okay, uh, build a HTTP request and then like format the URL with your access token and, and you know, uh, the method name and then pass in a request body in the way that Telegram has required it. So it, using Telegram specifications, you don't have to do all that. All you have to do is create uh, an instance of the Telebot and then call this method. But before we get to this stage, uh, make sure that you have already uh, added your Telegram API token to the constants file. So just go to constants dot, <coughs> sorry, pi, right? And then make sure that this variable has been assigned the value that you were given for your bot. It's the same one that uh, you use for your Postman collection, right? Remember you have to edit and then, oh, shit. edit and then set a variable. Uh, local Telegram bot token. So this is the token that you will also need to set uh, on your backend application. Cause uh, when you use the library, the, they will be making a HTTP request on behalf of your, of your bot and you will need to give them that token. Yeah, so make sure that this value is set up. And then the next thing we will do uh, is to define a class that will contain information about the user. So just now I said, let's, uh, we will need to make sense of who is sending it, the name, and as well as the ID, and then what is the message. So 
uh, we can structure, uh, we can group together the user's ID and name into a single uh, class, uh, user.py, which contains the user uh, class. So it's a way of grouping together these related uh, values for your user. So what you will just need to do is uh, create your user class and just define like two variables, ID and name. ID being the chat ID and name being the username. So like if you re refer to the incoming post request, right? Something like this would be the, I think it's, yeah, they're the same. So something like this will be the chat ID. And this is the ID that you will use to identify where your message is going to, as well as the name of your user. So there's a first name and a last name. We'll probably just, uh, you know, group them together into a single name. So uh, you notice that in this package, we've created two other files. Uh, these are already written, like the code is already filled in for you. We thought maybe for user.py, we will uh, just create the class ourselves. So for classes, right, you, uh, you can use a constructor to build a class. So later, right, if you notice just now when I was talking about the telebot instance, uh, you can pass in like a value here to create an instance of the telebot. This is equivalent, right? I think if you can step. This is equivalent to calling this function where you pass in uh, any uh, number of variables that uh, arguments that you require, and then it will assign it to maybe uh, values that this uh, class object contains, and then return you an instance with all these values. So for this, right, later, if you want to create a user class, for example, you might call it user and user, and then you pass in like the ID and the name, and it will uh, build an instance of user using this constructor uh, function. And then these two uh, uh, other functions are just ways to access the ID property of your object. So uh, since we've assigned it to uh, the ID property of this user object under the variable uh, underscore ID and underscore name, later you can just easily uh, refer to this property by ID and name. So something like uh, print user ID. And this would be equivalent to returning this value that was initially assigned to the user object. Yeah, so uh, if you need this code, if you don't want to type it out, it's available here under part two, I think. Yeah, part two. Uh, you can just copy it into uh, the user file or you can refer to how the other classes are defined. Just make sure that uh, you, know, you provide these two uh, functions to access the values. Okay, so what we have done so far to recap for part two, we've uh, added our Telegram API token, and then we've also filled in the user.py class so that we can create an object that contains the uh, user information basically, right? So this is the, I guess the more uh, complicated part of uh, this part, which is where we try to obtain the user ID name and, and message from the request body. So this was the request body. We will need to uh, basically de deconstruct this and, and get those values out, like this, this message and Dexter and, and the ID. So for this, right, uh, you guys would need to open the utils.py. So this file is just uh, used to contain like uh, useful functions that you need that you can re uh, reuse across your other files. So the, the four methods that we will need to fill in today I mean, for this part would be being able to get the user from requests, uh, get from name, which will be caught by this. So this ex extracts the name from uh, whatever request body was provided to you. Maybe let me move it to the side of the screen as I do this part. Really here. Okay, so what we are interested in is passing the request body that was given to us when the webhook request came in and then getting uh, a user object and the user text, halo or, or whatever, you know. And we'll be filling up this, these three functions. Uh, one more function that we will need is 
we, we can just add in a helper function that basically uh, returns a Boolean, a true or a false, if all the values that are passed in are not blank. So this asterisk here is just uh, a way of specifying that uh, the arguments that can be passed into this function can be one or more uh, string values, right? So it is possible to call this uh, function with just a single string value, or you can even pass in more one or more string values. And I think when you try to debug this, right, it will be uh, a list of all the string values that you have uh, passed into the function. So this is just a helper because we'll be using it in other places as well, where we want to make sure that before we, you know, uh, make a request, you want to make sure that the input is, is proper, like we, we got all the values that we wanted, right? So we can fill in this part first. Uh, so for this function, right, we just want to make sure that we iterate over all the values that are passed into this. So assuming I do is not right. We want to iterate over each uh, value in this uh, var arcs argument and check that they are not uh, null or none type and that they contain a value. So this is equivalent to making sure that the value is not blank. Because uh, Python, right, uh, when you try to construct a conditional using just the, the name of the variable itself, if that variable is a string, then it will return true only if it is not blank. So this will return false. It's something like this will return true. So you want to make sure that it's not none type and that it is not blank. And you do this for all. Like this, make sure that uh, all these statements are true. Okay, and let's work on this part now. So looking at the request body, right? What you will need to try to get is these two values. Oh, sorry, first name and last name. So you'll want to return a string that combines these two values. So like uh, the string that will be returned from this function is Dexter maybe space F. That will be the from name. So for something like this, let me just paste the code first. Uh, the first thing we want to do is get the, this assumes, right, that you have passed in this from object, like request from. So we will assume that we are receiving this object. And then once you receive this, uh, this object, we will try to access the values for first name and last name. So when we do a request from on this object and try to access the, the value for first name, you will look for a key, first name and then return Dexter. And this uh, it will be assigned to this. And then the same for last name as well. So once this is done, right, and you have your two values, what we are basically doing is checking uh, with our helper function just now, it's not blank, to make sure that these two values are not blank. So if you have both a first and a last name, right, then we will return a name uh, with both of these values, like Dexter space, Dexter space F. Uh, however, right, if you only have a first name, in this case, uh, maybe for me, right? Like if it, if it came like this, for example, it only has Dexter and then there's no last name. Uh, in this case, with this branch, you will just return the first name. So you'll just return Dexter. And finally, right? Uh, if none of these values are available, like in this case, then we will just return a blank string. Okay. Then using this, we can now return the user object that we created. So just now we create a user class, right? With uh, ID, which is the chat ID and then the name as well. So now we will want to extract that from the actual request body. So the whole thing. So just now we were just uh, focusing on this bit. Now we want to get a user object from this whole thing. So uh, the first thing we are doing here is to check that uh, this object, this request body contains a message view. So if message in this object, if there's a few message, then we will try to access message from ID. So like we will try to get the from because we will need to pass it to this to get the name, right? So the first thing we'll do is we try to get message. And then you notice that there's a second argument here. 
So uh, for get, right, you are able to supply a default value if this uh, field does not exist. So, okay, technically we are already guaranteed that uh, the request body has a message field. So we are guaranteed to get something, but uh, I guess to be safe, we can just make sure that when we try to access nested values like this, uh, we always supply a default value because assuming this returns a null, then this, this get on the null or on the none type object will then throw an exception later on. So we'll get message, uh, else uh, empty object, and then get from. So what this returns, right, is this bit right here. From your, yeah, from your whole request body, it will return the from. And then uh, after that, we will try to build a new user object. So we are calling this init function, uh, constructor function here, and pass it a user ID and a name. <clears throat> we, will we will build a new user object and then return uh, the value that is in the ID key, else again, we return a default, default blank value. So from this thing, we will return whatever value is specified for ID, if not return a blank string, or, and then as well, uh, we will call this function that we, uh, defined just now, which is to get the name as a string. So like Dexter F. So what you can expect given this request body is a user, user yeah, this value and Dexter F. It's equivalent to yeah, getting a user object with these two values. Okay. Uh, oh, let's return here. Okay, uh, the next, let's see. Yeah, the, so there were three functions, right, that we had to write. The first one was to get the user object with user ID and user name. The second function is to get the user text, which is what the user said, like user said hello, for example. So this is more straightforward because uh, you don't have to like get access from and then continue to build like a user object. All you need is a string value. Uh, that, that contains this halo. So again, we are checking to make sure that uh, you know, the message view exists in this request body. And then we will try to access the message object, which is this, this, yeah, this thing. And then once we are here, we try to access uh, the value of a few called text, else we return a blank string. And then here we return a blank string if there's no message in the first place. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, with these three functions, uh, what we can do at this point in time is to, whenever we send a message to the bot, we are able to extract uh, user ID, user name, and user message. The next thing we want to do, right, uh, is to send a message to the user. So for this, we will need to use the Telegram library that we've installed. So uh, try to access, uh, open up your Telegram API file this file will contain functions for you to send a message to a given user. Uh, you notice that this uh, function accepts a user and a response. So it will send whatever response you want for user. You can ignore state and session ID because that's that will be used later when we have the dialog flow part of our bot. So although it, it's part of the method signature, right? You won't actually be, be using these uh, values for now. And then this is a second uh, function that lets you send a message with options. So you notice that there are two additional arguments, options, which is a list of uh, string values. So like option one and so on. And then you can specify the row width, which will correspond to how many options are provided uh, per row. So I'm not sure if you've seen the options yet. But okay, later on when you see it, right, uh, there'll be a couple of options that will come up. And this value, row width, determines how many they can squeeze into a single row. So if you provide like five options and row width is two, then you will have three rows. The top, the first two rows will have two options and, and you know the last row will just have a single option that's like expanded to fill the whole width of the keyboard. Yeah. So uh, the beauty of using that library that we installed is you just, like I mentioned, just initialize the bot and then uh, do a bot dot uh, send message, right? So that's, it, it, that is literally all there is. Like you are creating the bot here and I'll just paste the code in. 
those things in session ID like I mentioned was just for logging. So you, you don't have to like really care about it right now. You're just printing it in the console later to make sure that we are yeah, executing this part, like calling this function. So uh, for send message is uh, really straightforward. You just call the send message function of your bot and then you pass it the user ID. So to access the value, right? Recall that we did this, then we provided this function to get the ID. And then in the utils uh, function just now, we were able to construct a user object with an ID and a name. So now when we want to send a message and we pass in the user object to get the ID, we simply have to uh, access it this way. And then you send a message to this user ID and this response. Okay, and the second function is okay, slightly more complicated, but because we're also using a library, we are able to just make use of uh, classes that that library has defined. So if you recall just now during the presentation, uh, I spoke about the two types of keyboards, right? The first one is uh, reply keyboard, which is the keyboard that replaces your your traditional keyboard with options. And then when you click it, it sends a text to the, to the chat history. The second one is inline keyboards where the options are literally part of the bot response. And when you click it, it just stays there and it sends a call back to your backend application. So for our case, we will be using a reply keyboard. And to do that, we need to specify a reply markup field, right? In the request that we make to Telegram. So this is basically uh, how the API li uh, client library that we are using uh, does it. You just have to pass it a markup object. And then it, in the HTTP request that your application makes under the hood to Telegram servers, it will contain the reply markup field with like all these things formatted for you. So we notice that we are passing it a couple of arguments. The first time, the first one is one time keyboard. The second one is a uh, row with. So row, row with, I've already like, uh, uh, spoke, uh, spoken about it. It just controls how many options are shown on the menu per row. And one time keyboard, right? Like uh, it is a flag, it's either true or false that determines uh, after you select the keyboard, does the keyboard disappear? So if you only need that response for a single interaction, like as part of that initial, uh, maybe introduction or whatever, greeting, uh, after the user selects an option, the keyboard just uh, disappears. So we, for that, we will just set it as true and then add our list of string options to the markup and pass an additional reply markup parameter to send message. So this, will, this is a helper function for us to send uh, a response back to the user, given a user object and, and and all the rest of this stuff. Okay. So finally, we have a way to decipher uh, the request body, get user information. And now we also have a way to send the send whatever we want to the user. So we have these two things now. All we have to do, right, is to update our webhook function. So, so we are going back to this webhook function, which uh, right now as it stands, it just prints the uh, request body, right? The, the thing that, I showed you here, it just prints it as a string. Like it doesn't really do anything. So now that we have those functions, what we want to do is to <clears throat> send a message back to the user uh, based on what was contained in the request body. So we'll be using firstly the, the function that we've defined in utils to get the user object. We will also be calling the function to pass the request body and get the input. So hello. And then we will be sending a message. Like here we are formatting it as something like receive your message, hello to you, uh, smiley face. But uh, yeah, we can also maybe put in the name if we want. So like uh, receive your message, hello, hello to you. Uh, and then you have to pass it a second argument. You have the name already because it's contained in this user object. So all you have to do is user.name. And then it will be format, it will format this string and inject the user's halo into this part and the user's name into this. And then it will send a message back to the user. So once you've done uh, all this, let us restart the application. Go down. Okay. Let us restart the application and then we send a message. Okay. Uh, one useful trick, right? Maybe as you are writing your code, uh, I can introduce the debugger. So I'm not, uh, depending on how you're starting the application, right? If you are using the run button here or if you're using a right-click.min, 
there's always an option to run it in debug mode. So debug mode allows you to step through your program because it's ex executed line by line, right? So you are able to pause your, the execution of your program at a certain line. So how you will do that is to, you can click this gap here between the line number and your actual code and add a breakpoint so that uh, when this function is executed, if you are running the program in debugger mode, it will actually pause the execution at this stage. So let's, I'll demonstrate it by adding a couple. If you don't want it later, you can just click again and it will be gone. So you'll add a couple of breakpoints and then you can either click on this thing beside play, which will run in debug mode, or you can right click main and debug run. So let's do debug run uh, using this. And then, uh, yeah, once it's started, let's just send a message. Hello there. You can notice that as the function, uh, as the request comes in and the execution of this function starts, right? You can see that it stops here. Of course, we added a debugger and then this whole line gets uh, highlighted. If we go into the debugger, uh, okay, you would see variables available here, but not right now. Uh, you can see that it stopped here. To move on to the next line, all you have to do is resume program and it will continue executing until it encounters the next breakpoint. So I can click play and you see that it jumps here. And then now there's an additional variable because we assigned it to request body. And it, it's helpful because it like shows you uh, what's contained in, in whatever variables that you have at, at the current point in time. So you can click on view to expand it and you can see that whatever is contained in the, for example, the message. Right, so uh, another useful trick is to uh, use this calculator icon here. And assuming you are, at, you are paused at a debugging point, right? You can continue, uh, you can evaluate certain expressions. So let's say I want to find out the value of this. I don't have to wait for it to get assigned. I can easily just click on the calculator and then you can see that it's evaluating. And you can just paste in whatever you want to evaluate and click evaluate. And then you can see that it executes this and you can identify that, okay, after calling this function, uh, it indeed returns a user object with uh, ID and name as a string and an integer, for instance. And you can do the same thing with this. So even before this program is, uh, I mean, this line is executed, you can see that we're paused here, right? You can also execute this, evaluate this in advance to see that you know, you're getting the right thing. And you see that it's hello there. So once I, I click play again, you can see that I'm stuck here. Uh, okay, I think uh, it advanced a bit cause if the, if the uh, web pull request doesn't receive a response immediately, right? It will try to send it multiple times. So you can ignore this, these flashes first. So you can see that the values are assigned correctly. You have a user object with the right values and you have a correct string. So if I click play again, and then yeah continue executing this. Cause you see that I, I, like I said, it tried to send multiple requests cause it did not re receive a response immediately. So we actually process like multiple requests uh, for the same message. Like it's a retry mechanism on Telegram site. So yeah, so all you've done so far, right? Was uh, write your Telegram API methods to, to, to be able to send a message to your user and then be able to extract uh, information from the user. And with these two, uh, these two items, we can now send a response back to our Telegram bot. Uh, receive your message, hello there, hello to you, that's that. Yeah, and then you can test it out with different stuff. If you look in the console, uh, we are also logging like uh, the fact that the Telegram API method that we wrote was, was like executed. Like this was the thing that we logged here sending response for user and then we formatted it. So we are able to verify that this was the response sent for this. So with this, uh, we've done the, the core portion of the workshop. Uh, moving on, we will show you how to integrate it with Dialogflow, which is, uh, I guess we have only 30 minutes left. So we'll try to move fast for this. Uh, Cause uh, most of the code is actually already provided for the agent. So all you have to do is uh, later on would be to update your webhook function to be able to call Dialogflow's uh, API. Because instead of having to write the Dialogflow API class like we did for Telegram API, we actually uh, already uh, provided it for you. So to explore right, like the capabilities of what you can do with 
a NLP bot. We've just provided this code and we'll be showing you uh, the order bot. So I'll, I'll take like a two minute uh, break. Maybe if anyone has issues getting to this stage, uh, which is to send a response from your bot back to the user, you can just raise it up uh, or you can finish up the rest of whatever you are, you are left to do for part two. Uh, can I just check if there are any exceptions thrown in your console? So like, uh, firstly, right, are you able to get the incoming web pull request? And then uh, are you able to get to this state? So if you, if you tried the debugger, was it able to execute uh, these three lines first? And then uh, when it executed this, right, what was the response? Uh, okay. uh, what are you referring? Oh, you mean this line doesn't show when you start your application? Oh, this line. Okay. Uh, have you tried the, the debugger? Are you able to uh, receive the webhook? Uh, did you do your Postman setup and, and configure the web hook and then receive it when you send a message to the bot? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we only have 25, 27 minutes. Uh, let me see. Uh, Mani and Sean, maybe you can help uh, yeah, I'll go and I'll carry on with the last because we have three parts left to go. I don't think we'll be able to ha handle uh, <clears throat> commands today. So maybe we'll just make sure that we finish three and four to get a working ordering bot. Uh, in okay. the next, yeah. no problem. Uh, Money and myself will go to breakout room one first to take a look at it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so for now, we will start with part three. Part three, I, I guess, is the more exciting part because right now, uh, we, we have got the bot working and it's able to get the input and then uh, send a response back to us. So part three is uh, basically connecting it with our Dialogflow agent. So uh, the way Dialogflow works is uh, you will have to make requests for each uh, user input. So if I say hello, we will, need, we will be making a, a single request to Dialogflow to get them to identify uh, if there are any matches for their input. And the way that we ensure these requests always go to the same uh, conversation, because we uh, Dialogflow uses sessions to make sure that for each user, we, we preserve whatever they, were, they have said in the past and, and any context they're active or any state that's active in the conversation. Uh, they use something uh, called sessions, which uh, have a time span of roughly uh, 20 minutes. And we to make sure that your requests are always going to the same session, 
we need to pass in a unique ID value or the session ID value. So uh, right now, right, what we will need to do is to make use of the cache uh, that we've installed just now to generate and store session ID across requests. Because whenever you send a request to your bot, right, like you say hello, and then the next request comes in, it loses context of what was previously uh, created in your application. So we need to make sure that we, we, make, we always give the uh, same session ID for requests coming from the same user. So let's go to cache.py, and you'll notice that uh, there are other methods here, but, but these are more for uh, keeping track of what has been ordered, and they've already been filled in. So I won't, probably won't go through it because we don't have much time left. We will just be focusing on <clears throat> this function for using a cache to uh, maintain session IDs across requests, coming across webhook requests. So we will need to, here's how, uh, what we'll need to do. We will first need to uh, check the cache if there's an active session. If there's an active session stored in the cache, right? The cache is basically like a memory space. Uh, if there's something stored there, then we return that active session. That, that's the session that the user is currently in. And maybe there was a previous request that, that created that session. If there's one, then we return it. If there is no session in the cache, then we will create one uh, new session ID and then store it in the cache. So it, it, that's all we are gonna do for this method. So uh, for storing items in the cache, right? Uh, we will need to specify a way to identify that the item is there. So this is done by using a key. So it's, it's equivalent to a dictionary. We've actually created a dictionary cache of key value uh, pairs. So we will need to make sure that we have a function that returns a unique key for a specific user. So uh, there's nothing more specific than the user ID, right? Like the user ID, ID identifies the user. So we can easily construct a key for the cache item using uh, some prefix, okay, maybe session, and then we format it with the user's ID. So it accepts a user and then it returns a session ID uh, key. And then this, this function will be, will be called by our get current session function above. Just paste it in. So uh, like what I mentioned just now, uh, okay, the first two lines are just to build the session key for this particular user. And then the second one is to check if it exists in the cache. So it will just uh, do a get, something like a dictionary. You'll just find, try to find an object with this session key and uh, get it, assign it to this session ID variable. And then we are using that it's not blank util function that we uh, defined just now to see if that object exists. Because if it doesn't exist, then you'll return a, a none probably. And then uh, this will return false. So if it exists, then we will just create a new session object with the session ID. And the second uh, Boolean flag that you see here is a parameter is new. So this is just for us to identify whether the session was newly created or it had previously existed in the cache and we're just fetching it and then returning it. So going back to our cache uh, file, yeah, so you'll return a new session object with the ID and false. So it's not a new one because it was previously in the cache and it's not blank. Else, right, if it's blank or none, then we will need to create one. So we are just using a UUID. A UUID is like a unique identifier, a, a string of around 30 plus characters, random characters. So this generates a random character, a random string each time. And then we assign it as the new session ID. We are quite sure that it probably wouldn't conflict because uh, yeah, there are not many users anymore. And, and then we will set it in the cache with the given key and the new session ID. And finally, we will return a session object with the new session ID that we've just generated and is new as true, indicating that this session is newly created. In, in other words, we'll be processing this request as the first interaction of the session. Okay, so the next part is to make the request to Dialogflow, right? just close all these files. So in our webhook function, uh, I mean, in our, not web, yeah, in our controller file, let us write a function that will allow us to uh, make a request to Dialogflow. I pasted it here. We will call it process Dialogflow input where we 
get a user object and a, yes, a session object and the input from the user. And then we call this function. This function is from the Dialogflow API class, which allows us to uh, make a detect intent request given a session ID and a user input. So detect intent is basically another way of, I mean, it's basically trying to find a match among all of the intents you have, that we have set up for the agent given a user input in the context of this session ID. So for this session, I want to try to find a matching intent for this user currently. And then what's returned is an intent result. And uh, I'll show you what it is by printing it. Maybe let me start the application again. Okay, I'll add a debugger, yeah, I don't have to add a debugger, I guess we'll print it. I'll just say hello. Oh yeah, of course I'm not calling it. Okay. Uh yeah. So after we've done this, we, we need to actually call the method. Right. So let me just replace this with this. So uh the only changes, maybe I'll just copy line by line the change. What we need to do apart from getting the user object and the user input, right, is to also get the session. So we are using that cache uh session function, uh get current session function to get uh, either a new session or an existing session that's stored in the cache. And then using this, we will then call uh, this function that we've created to, to call dialog flow. And then store it in intent result. We're not really doing anything with it now, so we'll just leave it as it is. Uh, but yeah, once you have this, it will execute this function and print whatever was returned by dialog flow. Let me just rerun. Okay, so a lot more stuff here. The, there's the usual sending response to a user here, but this part is new. This is the query result from a dialog flow. So uh, whenever we have a match right on an existing intent, there are certain properties in the result that we'll be using uh, and you recall that just now I, I went through a few of them. Action, which is uh, whatever string you want to configure for this intent to uh, instruct your application to do something. So in this case, it would be after the user has said hi there uh, on this session, it would uh, we want to display main greeting. So display like, hello, uh, welcome to Ninja Cafe. And then uh, another uh, useful value is fulfillment text, which is the response. Uh, so for this intent, we have configured a couple of responses for this intent. Not sure if I can still pull it up. Yeah. So for this intent that was matched, this is the one that was matched. Like you can see that it's trained with hello sir, hello again. Like so, whenever you say something along these lines, right? It's able. It doesn't have to be contained here. It can be something along the lines because uh, there's a machine uh, learning algorithm that that tries to. Uh, match any input uh, given these training phrases. And then you can see the usual display main greeting action. And more importantly, right, we have set up multiple uh, responses. Uh, so dialog flow, when this intent is matched, it will pick uh, a random one from, from these three, uh, welcome, greetings, and hi, and then you'll return it in the result. So going back to the result, you can see that it shows the welcome, uh, welcome response. And it's part of fulfillment text. So this, this just means the response. And there's also other information that it's not really important since uh, we won't be going over the agent, like, like the context. And yeah, you can see which intent was specifically matched, uh, Ninja Cafe made. And yeah, the other things are not really important. So uh, what we've done so far is successfully call dialog flow and obtain a result of a matching intent for this given input, which is high there. But uh, we want to do something right with we, it, with this. Uh, that will be part four. Maybe since we are almost running out of time, I will just move on to part four. So in part three, what we have done is to just call dialog flow and then see what was uh, in the result. So the final part is to do something with that result. So with this uh, action of display main greeting, we need to do uh, we need to execute some code. Like we want to print a specific response to the user, for example. So with this, right, we will be using, 
all the functions that, that have already been, been defined in this file, intent handlers.py. It has a list of functions that will later be paired to an existing action. So this was the action. Maybe I can copy it somewhere. So this was the action here. Uh, we have multiple actions uh, that the intent uh, that the agent uh, will return, depending on the intents that were matched. And the full list, uh, along with the description, is available in the in this file here. If you go to part four, right, I think there's a table with the diagram and also like all the all the actions that have been set up for this agent, and then as well as what's expected. So it will look something like like this. You can see uh, the list of actions we have. And for display main greeting specifically, we want to send a response with the, the text response in the intent, just now the welcome whatever message, and format it with the user's name, and then show suggestions, suggestions in the form of buttons that they can click. So for what the user can do, so they can order food or check menu and stuff. Yeah, so, these are the rest of the functions that will be handling the other actions that you see in that file. And uh, at the very end, right, you can see that we've uh, constructed a dictionary. So basically a mapping from a specific action to a specific function that we have defined uh, up here. So later we will try to access these functions depending on the actions uh, action value that was in the result. So if, if there's a result with this action, then we will try to access the corresponding function here and then just call it. That's all we have to do for at least this part of the workshop. So let me go back. <clears throat> In our webhook now, right, like instead of just printing the intent result, what we will want to do is to uh, call the function. Before that, let us add an additional util helper function. There's one more blank one. I think the rest are already filled in. Default in blank, uh, default if blank which basically uh, returns the second argument if the first one is blank. So it's, uh, I don't really have, I guess I don't have to go through much. It's just a function that either returns you the first one or the second one, depending on whether the first one is blank. So the first one will usually be something that you care about, like maybe username, but then you want to return, and return another value if, if username is not available, for instance. So let's just add that in. Uh, it should be available in this document, or I can also paste it here because I will be moving on now. And go back to controller.py. And right here, we want to remove this statement. And we want to make sure that uh, the instead of just printing the result, we want to do something about it. So the first thing we can do is to figure out what's the action for this result. What is this value here? So from the intent result, we will try to access the action value or else you know, we use that function that we uh, declared just now, which is to return a blank string. So we want to find out what's the action for the result. And if this action is not blank, then we would call the appropriate function in that map just now. So this was the dictionary of action to function that we have defined just now. And we are basically trying to access uh, a given function using this action value. So at this point in time, it will return display main greeting. And if this, if this wasn't blank, if there's actually a value, it's display main greeting, it will try to get the corresponding function for this action. And then this, like uh, I think you've seen this before, this is like specifying a default value. So if there's no uh, corresponding function, right? If it somehow doesn't exist in this dictionary, then we would just return, I mean, yeah, the handle invalid intent, which is also defined here. Uh, <clears throat> briefly speaking, it just sends a message. It just sends a response back to the user that is, sorry, I did not understand you. Like, what are you trying to say? So this is the function. And then once we have this function, this returns a function, right? For this action, we'll call it with uh, three values, the user user information, the, the result that was returned from dialog flow and the session ID. Because you notice that each of these, these handler functions, right? They all accept the same uh, 
three parameters. And depending on what they are supposed to do, they will either use one or more of these uh, values. So now that we've updated this, we're not simply just printing it, right? Like we are actually executing a function depending on the action. The last thing we have to do is to update our webhook to use these results. You see it's like slightly drayed out because we just assigned it and then we really like didn't do anything. In fact, uh, we don't even need to assign it anymore because this function here will just do the response for us. We don't even need this. Like this will return a function and all of these functions, if you notice, right, have a send message. So depending on what it's called, right, it will just uh, do the message response for us and we no longer have to send this. So let me just remove it and then add an additional one. We are just doing, uh, actually this line might not be needed, uh, but we are just doing some validation to make sure that there's a user ID and the user input so that you know, if the user doesn't say anything, we, we don't call the function. So yeah, that's all we have. Like if it's not blank, then process it as a dialog flow input. So let's do the demo now. I will start the application. And also I'm running in debugger. So let's, for the first time we do this, let's just debug it a few times. Let's put it all over. Uh, let's say, hey, so it, it gets received. Let's go to the next part. So it's not blank, right? Because they are, it's containing the request body. So you'll call this function. And after calling this function, it jumps here. So it will try to detect an intent. So I, I don't want to execute it twice. So I'll just skip ahead and we can examine what's in the result. So this is the result. It, it should be the same one that was received here and it should, should also be locked. Okay, maybe not yet. Uh, yeah, remove that. So this, it should be the same result that we got here. And I think it also, oh, it has a different response this time, see? Like previously it was welcome. So now we shuffled to another response. So it's hi, your name and welcome. So since this action that we've extracted, see, yeah, we extracted an action and you can see here that it's display main greeting. It's not blank. So we want to actually process a function. And with display main greeting, we are going to get the, oh, another request came in. Uh, we are going to get the display main greeting function. So <clears throat> let's just evaluate it. And you can see that it returns a function display main greeting. Like assuming it's some garbage string, right? Like it's going to repeat, uh, return this function because if it can't find it in this, then it's going to return handle invalid intent. So I will just evaluate it. And you can see that it returns the handle invalid intent because it was not contained in intent handlers. So with intent result, I mean the actual action, we will get the display main greeting and then it will call it. So let's also step to that. So we know that it will call this because from evaluating, we actually saw that it returned that function. So let's stop it here. And you see uh, it skipped to here. And what this is doing, right? Uh, very briefly, I'll just, uh, talk about it. It's trying to access the response for human text, which is this string here, and it will format it with the name uh, and replace it here. So it will try to inject uh, my name Dexter, else if it's not found, it will replace uh, inject customer. So you can see if I skip forward, it, the response got assigned a value of hi Dexter F, welcome, how can I help you? And then we are sending it with some options, which is like uh, a list of strings or for what the user can do. And I guess this is about it. Like you see, if I just continue playing. Oh, okay, send it a couple of times because I had multiple requests. So yeah, it actually triggered a, a multiple detect intent requests because we didn't return immediately. But this should be the first one because when we remember when we debug, we saw that the greeting message was high something. So it sent a response with my name formatted nicely. And then it gave me a couple of options. So at this point in time, I will just uh, move on to the demo for the bot because I think uh, uh, the rest of the, the stuff is basically, ju basically just making use of what's in intent handlers. And this, I don't think we will be covering this portion of the code because we are ending in five minutes and I don't even think we'll be able to handle commands. But if you're interested, uh, feel free to uh, visit part five of the branch and also look at the part five guide.
I think the guide is more comprehensive because it actually talks about uh, why, uh, what we are doing in certain parts of the code. So if you missed it, right, like uh, feel free to just read, read through the guide again and see what else uh, you missed out or what else you want to do with this bot. Uh, there's the option in part five to you know, handle commands. Uh, I will do a demo after I'm done with this for part five, but we won't be coding it. So for now, I'll just continue using the bot. <coughs> So at this point in time, uh, we are we are shown, <coughs> we are presented with reply keyboards with four options. Uh, we can click on anything we want. Uh, and clicking on it will just send a message in the chat history. So if I click on what is on my menu, it will show up here. And then it will send this string uh, to the user. And then it will send this string to, uh, not to the user, to the application. And then we will process it by calling dialog flow again. And then uh, you'll return the result. Don't think I'm debugging anymore. Yeah, so at least we have this. So now we know that, okay, this intent was matched for this session and then it sent this response. So I can say something like, I would like order uh, two blueberry donuts, one cookie and three Caesar salads. And then, yep, it responds accordingly. It matches a function and it gives me an I'm done option. No, I'm not done. I want another two Caesar salads, please. And then let's just have one more item, maybe a BLT. Thanks. So uh, we are using the functions just now that were already provided in cache to just keep track of all these items. And then when you're finally done, right, you can either type or just say I'm done it will match the this intent and then give you an option and it will round up like uh what are the items that you have previously ordered so i ordered two donuts one cookie three salads later i topped up with two salads that makes it five and a VL, blt and then at this point i can either cancel or submit the order and i say yes submit thanks okay i don't know if this works because there's a typo let's just try and then uh if the machine learning Goes off. Yeah, okay, it, it did. So yeah, it recognized that uh, it was trying to match the submit order in 10. So it matched this submit 10 and it submitted my order and it says, okay. So now let's go back to the main menu. And then I say hello again. I want to see what uh, the orders I've submitted so far. Uh, I think there'll be three because I was testing with two of them. So yeah, you can just ignore this. This was from yesterday. Uh, but you can see that the one we just placed right at uh, 427, it has the items that I wanted. So uh, I guess briefly, I'll just mention that this is pulling from, uh, we, we created a couple of endpoints uh, uh, on our site. So this is using our internal APIs to just list and create orders. So if you want to test it out, you'll probably need to uh, create your own database. And then instead of calling uh, order API, what you want to do is to just replace this by storing uh, the orders in a database and then you know fetching it from there and stuff like that. So there are other functions that you, I mean, there are other things you can do. What do you guys sell? And you should match the menu intent. Yep, check menu. And then it tells me this. And then what are the other things? Hello. I can see where is my order and then it'll just give me some random response. I, I don't think we have any logic for this yet. And yeah, uh, okay, one minute. Let me just pull the code from uh, part five and then I'll show it. Uh, yeah, I'll just show the comments very briefly and then maybe Wesley can round up. Okay, never mind. Maybe we don't have time. Uh, yeah. If you are, if you guys are interested, uh, just pull out uh part five, and you can look at how commands work with our bot. But I think that's it for now. I have to give it back to to Wesley. Okay, Wesley, you can take over. All right. Dexter, Dexter, can you just uh show the last slide? Yeah. Thanks, Dexter. Uh, and I hope everyone here uh, managed to take something away from this workshop. Um, and hopefully, with the slides as well as other resources that our 
facilitators have provided, you should be able to build your own Telegram bot. Anyways, we are always hiring. Ninjaban always hires a lot of fresh grads and interns every summer. Um, we also hire for um, part-time interns as well, sometimes during the December period as well. So, you know, we really welcome um, any of you who's interested in learning more about some of the products that we're building, learning a bit more about, you know, how to kind of build um, software in, in a very scalable manner, right? Uh, how to learn more of these industry practices um, to apply. And uh, yeah, you get, might get, get a chance to meet Sean, Mani, and Dexter in real life. Uh, so yeah, thanks for, for attending this uh, event. Uh, I understand that uh, Hack and Roll might send you guys a, a survey, post, a, post event survey. So please fill it up. Uh, we do want to kind of improve the workshop for future participants. So um, that will really help us out. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, uh, the team from Ninja Fan who have broke the workshop for today. Yeah. Actually, do you mind if do you still have more slides, or do you mind if I switch to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I think this slide is, uh, also works. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you, the team from Ninja Fan. Thank you, Sean, Mani, Dexter, Wesley, Elisa also here, I noticed. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And thank you uh, to the all of the participants who have come to the workshop today. Yeah, we, have, uh, we are very grateful to having all of you today. And yeah, today is the fourth workshop and also the last one before Hack and Roll. Hope you all enjoy the session and yeah, hope the workshop uh, just now could bring like a lot of insights for probably like give you inspiration for the projects to be built during the hackathon. And yeah, we are we would really appreciate it if you can give us feedback uh, in the slides uh, is the QR code. You can scan it and give feedback to us. And also via the chat, I have also put the links to the feedback form for, uh, for Ninja, Fan, uh, Ninja Fan. Yeah, we will also send another post workshop email to all of you which will contain the link to the slides, the repository, all the workshop materials, and also like the feedback form. And also, oh, oh, and we will also send the link to the recording. So yeah, do uh, keep a look for it. Yeah, and yeah, someone asked how we can access the recording. Yeah, I will send an email. Uh, basically the recording will be posted to our uh, YouTube channel. So we have a YouTube channel and US Hackers, which we, where we post all our, uh, post the videos for all of our events, Hacker School, Friday Hacks, and, F uh, and Hack and Roll. We have released the video for our first two workshops. And yeah, we are going to release the videos as well for our third and uh, last workshop, this one. Yes, yeah, uh, feel free to use the materials that are given. Uh, I mean, like the purpose of this workshop is definitely to help everyone to prepare for the hackathon itself. Yeah, definitely you can use the materials to to during like the hackathon, but yeah, just don't copy paste the code and then like yeah, yeah. I mean you know uh, you need to build your project by yourself during the hackathon itself. But you can you can take a look at the uh, materials for the workshops for reference. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything more to add from the Ninja Fan team? No, I don't think so. Uh, from our side, I think we enjoyed uh, having you guys attend this session. And yeah, we are open to, uh, I mean, if you guys uh, need any help, uh, feel free to drop a line to Wesley or wherever and, and um, let's see what advice we can give you after that. Yep. If that's all then, yeah, I think uh, we, have, we are reaching towards the end of the workshop for today. Thank you for everyone who have come and yeah, feel free to ask to give us any question if you have in the you can email to us core team at nushackers.org or you can also uh, write something in the workshop channel in the discord for hack and roll 2021 and yeah then yeah we are reaching the end and guess we'll uh, we'll be closing the workshop soon yeah thank you everyone for coming and thank you for the ninja fan team for the for preparing thank this you. workshop all right thanks thank bye you so much. Thank you. nice to have you guys